Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for episode one of our new webinar series. My name is Grant Petrosian and I'll be moderating this panel with Alina Beck. We have a very interesting and timely program planned for all of you today with two wonderful speakers who are extremely knowledgeable when it comes to crypto and blockchain technology. First, I'd like to introduce our new webinar series that the Young Lawyers Committee of the Armenian Bar Association is officially launching today with this program. A few months ago at a virtual law center reception organized by the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut chapter of the Armenian Bar Association, I shared with the law students that it's really a great time for young attorneys just entering the legal profession. One of the main reasons, at least in my opinion, is that there are many interesting areas of the law that are just emerging or developing, including cryptocurrency and blockchain, cannabis law, esports, online gaming, and climate change. Shortly after the law student rece reception, the Young Lawyers Committee decided to launch a series of webinars on these various topics with the main purpose of providing some introductory yet useful information, as well as some advice as to what lawyers need to know in order to practice in these areas. And this includes young attorneys who just entered the profession, as well as more seasoned attorneys who are interested in transitioning their practice to any of these areas. We plan on organizing one webinar on a specific topic each month. In fact, we just finalized the speaker lineup for the next one, which will be held on in next month in June on climate change. We're excited to kick off our webinar series with this panel on cryptocurrency and blockchain. I'm sure everyone has been hearing about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, maybe even Dogecoin, even those of you who are not closely following this space. There has been a lot of developments on this topic and there is certainly a lot to talk about. In fact, there's so much to discuss we are already planning part two of this cryptocurrency and blockchain series, which will be held sometime this summer and will focus on other aspects of this space, such as NFTs. We are fortunate to have two truly knowledgeable speakers today and look forward to hearing their thoughts and experiences. We will leave some time toward the end of the program to take a few questions from the audience. So please feel free to ask a question in the chat box at any time during this program. Also, we thought it would be fun and interesting if we have a lightning round where we will give the speakers a word or a name and ask them to share with us the first thing that comes to their mind. So with that, Alina, can you please introduce our two speakers? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm thrilled to introduce our two speakers today. Our first is Henry Arslanian. And for those who don't already know Henry, Henry is the PwC crypto leader and partner, the former chairman of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong, and an adjunct, adjunct professor at the University of Hong Kong. Henry advises many of the world's leading crypto exchanges, investors, financial institutions, and tech firms on their fintech and crypto initiatives, as well as governments, regulators, and central banks on fintech, crypto regulatory, and policy matters. Henry is a TEDx and a global keynote speaker and a best-selling published author. We are also very excited to have Rika Kurdayan here with us today. Rika is the founder of KS Tech Law and her practice involves blockchain, virtual currencies, DSOs, STOs, and tokenization of assets. She provides transactional and regulatory advice to participants in the FinTech space and represents token issuers, trading platforms, and traditional crypto investment funds. Rika has been named a rising star in the technology transaction sector by super lawyers in the New York metro area. She has been actively involved in conferences worldwide as a panel speaker and has presented globally on the regulatory aspects of blockchain technology and regulation of cryptocurrencies. Thank you again, Henry and Rika for joining us today. We're very excited to dive into today's topics with such talented speakers. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Thank Alina. You. Henry, let's start with the basics. What are cryptocurrencies and blockchain? <laughs> Great question. First of all, thanks for having us. Very honored of being here today. I remember I grew up as a young lawyer in Montreal when we used to, we used to have these uh, young Armenian bar associations in good old Montreal, Quebec at the Fasc and Martino offices. So great to be with you all. Great. To, thanks for letting us, uh, Farika and I, to share our passion on the future of money with, with you all today. So what are cryptocurrencies? So very, very, very good question. And I think we need to, I need to put my professor hat on. We used to go a bit to the basics. Uh, the reality is actually one of the big um, uh, challenges we've had for decades was what we call a double spend problem, which means, Grant, if I give you this dollar, I give it to you, you take it, and if you, you have it, you know it's not a fake, it went from me to you. 
The problem is when we went to a digital economy, if I take a picture of my iPhone of this dollar and I'll send it to you, it's great, but I could send the same one to Alina, Erika, and everybody else listening to this panel. And that's what we call the double spend problem. Uh, and so how do we so solve this double spend problem? We put great financial institutions in the middle who come and act as intermediaries. And this was this has been going on for a long time until in 2008, on Halloween day, six weeks after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, this white paper, eight page document arrives on the internet. And literally for the first time, we're able to send money value from one person to the other without any intermediary. And that was actually the Bitcoin white paper that came out from Satoshi Nakamoto, by the way, whoever he, she, or they are. And actually, obviously, since then, the market has evolved quite a lot. And today, if you look at total crypto market cap, it's over two or around $2 trillion. So obviously, it's, it went from really being something very niche to something that is very mainstream. However, there's different kinds of cryptocurrencies. Many people know, for example, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, which are often like, a, for example, Bitcoin is decentralized. There's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever. And actually, the value is really offering demand like any other commodity or asset you find there. But there's really way a lot of different type of assets. We have utility tokens. We have security tokens. We have non-fungible tokens, which I'm sure we'll talk about today. And we even have central bank digital currencies, which are digital currencies issued by the central bank. To put things in perspective today, there's over 9,000 types of actually crypto assets in the market right now. Uh, Bitcoin is obviously now around 40, 45% of it. But there's obviously quite a lot of them. And that's quite interesting because not only cryptocurrencies allow us to actually rethink how we're delivering value. And it's a kind of a, a store of value, unit of account, medium of exchange, which is definition of money over the, the centuries and, and thousands of years we've had. But actually really is a really empowering new ways of delivering finance. One of them, one of them that I'm sure we'll talk today is the centralized finance, which allows us to that deliver financial services without any intermediaries. So really, really exciting time. And that's why it's, this is probably one of the most exciting times in the future of money. And Bitcoin was the genesis of it uh, 13 years ago today. B Bitcoin oh. solved a lot of problems, but cannot unmute you though. <laughs> <laughs> so Henry, so you talked about cryptocurrencies, blockchain, uh, what are smart contracts? Can you share some more information on smart contracts? Absolutely. So, of course, when, when Bitcoin was invented, if you want, in, on Halloween day 2008, 2009, actually more practically speaking, uh, over the years, you know, technology evolved, people came up with new ideas. And then obviously one of the inventions we had around 2013, actually, 12, 13, was actually smart contracts. Actually, the platform that popularized this was a platform called Ethereum. Uh, that was actually uh, uh, did, did an initial coin offering in 2013. What are smart contracts? Is basically today, if you and I grant, we have a, we have, we want to come out into contractual agreement, we enter into a contractual way in any way or form, let's say in a written format. And obviously then, I, you know, if I promise you to give you this golf ball and that you're going to pay $10 for this golf ball, I give it to you and you hope to give me 10 bucks. But if you don't, I have to go find a lawyer, probably go to a court, try to get my $10 uh, obligation that you've had to pay me back. Uh, this obviously creates a lot of issues. And as we all know, especially in the legal system, uh, accessing kind of this remedy that we have is actually quite, quite challenging for various reasons that we know, not let alone legal, legal, legal fees. Uh, the benefit of smart contract is that we can program these into code. So for example, uh, let me give you a very simple example. We, let's, let's use the example of golf, in the topic of golf. Let's say we want to take a bet on the next PGA Tour uh, results. And we say, Grant, if, play, uh, if a player X uh, uh, scores a certain amount of uh, a golf, then automatically you get paid a certain amount in cryptocurrencies. We code that in the, in the, in the, in, in the, in the little smart contract saying, if X happens, then Y is the result. Very simple. There's no counterpart risk. If that payment happens, automatically you get the payment. And if it doesn't, you know, uh, the, I mean, I mean, the payment does not happen, for example. So the beauty of a smart contract is actually at the very basic level, you're able to codify some of the obligations that we would actually do uh, 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 otherwise in verbal forms and written form or whatnot, uh, and actually in, in code. And this is actually very, very powerful. Not only because this is very simple examples, but it really opens up a whole new world of opportunities. For example, this whole principle of smart contracts that I can actually kind of codify law or obligations. Uh, right now, when I was talking decentralized finance, which is really the cutting edge of cryptocurrencies today, enables me to do trading, borrowing, lending, asset management, even insurance 
purely in a decentralized ways using smart contracts. Again, with the premise of if something happens, then the result is very clear. Payment can happen automatically and so on and so forth. So that's what smart contracts is in a very, very short nutshell. There's obviously a lot more complications to this, but this is a quite short summary. Thanks, Henry. One more question before we turn it over to Rika. I know it's on everybody's mind what happened yesterday. Some people are comparing it to Black Monday. Uh, what are your thoughts? What can you share with us? Oh, absolutely. Yesterday was, I have to say, first of all, the last, the first, uh, the Q1 of 2021, the first, like, frankly, they're still the beginning of the year, has been historical in the, in the history, not of crypto, but the history of money. Uh, some of the changes we saw, volumes, retail adoption, as well as broader developments we've seen in crypto have been really uh, historic. I mean, that's the least we can say. Uh, what happened yesterday on uh, May 20th was actually quite incredible. I mean, we saw massive uh, plunge in the markets. A couple of things, I guess, for, for your viewers to know. Uh, one of them, crypto is inherently volatile, like any young asset class. If we do not like volatility, you should not get into crypto, especially if you're one of those conservative lawyers. Do not get into crypto. Uh, second thing we should not forget is that crypto markets do not sleep. If you want to enjoy your Friday nights with your kids, your Saturday, Sunday, go to your good old Armenian church, do not get into crypto. These markets do not sleep and actually moves all the time. And it's a global market as well. Uh, what happened really yesterday was quite a, I think it was a string of various events that happened. One, there was actually kind of a small sell-off that was happening for the last couple of days. Second, there was obviously this the kind of like Elon Musk tweets that came up, uh, which frankly, if this happened in the regulated space, I think there'll be a very good basis and, uh, of, of further investigation, but it is what it is. Uh, so actually, some of the, tweet, the tweets uh, from Elon Musk added to actually some of the debates around the environmental impact of Bitcoin, which we can talk about later today as well. I think the combination of all these things, uh, as well that you know, uh, other some of like uh, macro elements, including the news from China that China kind of reiterated what they, frankly they've been saying for many months that they they do not let uh, people buy Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, which again has been the policy for some time, kind of had a domino effect on it. Um, I think the uh, the many people will say. This was kind of, in a way, a buying opportunity. Uh, okay, we saw the price of Bitcoin actually recover based on that. Uh, but these kind of volatility events happen uh, and actually, uh, you know, are kind of inherent to the crypto markets. But frankly, let's not forget that just before Christmas, uh, Bitcoin was trading on seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars dollars $18,000. So again, this, this has been quite a rally over the last couple of weeks and kind of just a kind of pullback uh, that many would say was expected or is not. The reality is uh, it was quite a big jump, uh, quite a big drop actually from that perspective. Thanks, Henry. Alina? To get into regulation, this might be a question whose answer changes relatively quickly, but how are cryptocurrencies regulated in the U.S. today? Yeah, I'm happy to give a um, you know, general overview and Henry, excellent introduction of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Um, thank you. Um, the, the main question here is really, as Henry mentioned, there are different types of cryptocurrencies, right? There are currencies, there are utility tokens, there are security tokens, there are hybrid instruments, payment tokens, network tokens, tokens that are used to incentivize developers on the platform. So your regulation will largely depend on the type of digital asset you're dealing with. And um, of course, one of the most... Um, Famous regulators in the space, in the US at least, has been um, historically the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Although a lot of times when I work with projects and clients, I always say, um, and, and sort of the whole industry developed in a way of finding exemptions or some kind of framework to operate outside of SEC's purview and regulation, which I usually tell people it's not necessarily a good thing because if you're not regulated by the SEC, most likely you're like regulated by CFTC. If you're not regulated by CFTC, at the very least you're regulated by FinCEN and, you know, um, other authorities uh, on financial transactions. And uh, you might be regulated as a money transmitter, as a money service business. So there's really no scenario under which a blockchain project launches and exists in this gray zone and is not regulated. That has not been my experience, really. Um, so in the U.S., we're talking about two levels of regulation, right? On a state level and on a federal level. On a federal level, if we're dealing with, um, uh, let's call them 
blockchain-enabled tokens <laughs> or digital assets. Uh, I think the word cryptocurrency might be misleading in a sense that when we hear cryptocurrency, we automatically think of an actual currency, but there are many cryptocurrencies that function um, more like traditional securities, hybrid securities, they might be product tokens, utility tokens. So if we're talking about digital assets that have attributes of a security, it will be regulated by the SEC on a federal level. Uh, the SEC regulates the primary issuance of these instruments, the SEC regulates secondary trading transactions. Um, if we're talking about, let's say, a stable coin, right? Uh, and a stable coin is a digital asset that doesn't really fluctuate in value. It can be tied to traditional currency like uh, dollar or euro or yen, and um, the value remains stable. Well, if you're a platform that processes or network transactions in stable coin, most likely you'll be treated as a money transmitter, right? In the US, money transmitters are regulated on a state level, which essentially means you have to go into every single state and obtain a separate license. Then we have states like New York that came up with a completely new set of regulations like bit license. Uh, and then uh, if you're a money transmitter, you're probably gonna be regulated by FinCEN on a federal level. That means that you have to go and get a money services business. Um, CFTC, let's not forget about commodities. Um, a big chunk of any blockchain related project, especially when we're dealing with issuance. And if we're dealing with issuance of an instrument that's not exactly a security, but not exactly a product, tax is gonna be a big question. How is it going to be taxed? Uh, is it an equity raise? Is it a sale of forward contract? Um, you know, so there are really many, many regulations at place that you have to think through, but it always starts with one question. What it is that you're issuing, if you're an issuer of a cryptocurrency, why are you issuing it? How the currency will function? And essentially, what is the business model, right? And then from there, you're trying to uh, analyze and figure out how the regulators will treat this issuance. And um, that sort of informs your path to compliance. Thank you, Rika, that's fantastic. Um, before we move on to the next topic, can you speak a little about the privacy compliance issues of blockchain? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> so, um, there are two things to think about here, right? Um, uh, on the privacy aspect, and I'm not a privacy lawyer, I'm a securities lawyer, so I'll give you a bit of a high level overview. Uh, what we talk about, when we think about privacy, there are two aspects in place, the privacy of the information that's being transferred over blockchain, uh, but also with um, several block private uh, private blockchains, a big consideration will be compliance with anti-money laundering regulations. Uh, because depending on how the currency functions and how the platform functions uh, and how these currencies are being issued initially, um, if you function as a money transmitter or money service business, you need to have uh, certain compliance protocols in place so you need to be able to identify the parties you're dealing with, the parties who are transacting on your platform um, and staying private in the space uh, and not implementing a certain procedure. KYC and AML procedures is certainly an issue. Thank you. Graham? Henry, unless you want to add anything to what Rico, Rico said about regulations, I want to shift gears. Absolutely. I have to share about regulations. You know, as, as a nerdy lawyer, I love regulations. I think a couple of things to understand is, first of all, uh, in many countries, actually, regulatory clarity is not, uh, is not that big of a concern. I mean, just to put things in perspective, according to Cambridge University today, only 5% of regulators do not have somebody working on crypto. 
So actually, I'll be often I, I say that, you know, a lot of regulators around the world are actually way more knowledgeable than many of the financial service professionals and definitely a lot of lawyers when it comes to crypto. I mean, actually look in the ICC, the new chairman of the ICC right now is, used to teach crypto at MIT. You know, your former OCC uh, had now went to become the CEO of uh, Binance US, one of crypto exchanges and so on and so forth. There's a lot of these examples that happen on that. On the privacy, it's very interesting what Rika brought up because uh, one misconception people have is that oh, Bitcoin is used by drug dealers, Bitcoin is like criminals, it's, it's money laundering and so on and so forth. Let me give you a piece of advice. If you're looking at laundering money, do not use Bitcoin. Again, cash is, again, the most confidential way of actually doing this. The reason is when I give that's a grant, uh, like these, these dollar bills, you have no idea where this money coming from. There's no way of tracking it. Every single Bitcoin transaction is traceable. Every single one of them. Actually, this is the reason that a lot of actually criminal activity, actually people even on the dark net, on the, you know, the dark, the dark net, dark web, uh, and with, using Tor and system like these, they get caught as soon as they start using Bitcoin. So this is actually one of the biggest misconceptions that actually the people think is used by criminals and so on and so forth. Just to put some data out there, uh, in 2020, according to the data that is available, only 0.34% of crypto transactions were, were linked to illicit transactions. 0.34. In absolute terms, that's $10 billion. That's nothing. To put things in perspective, in the regu regulated space, in the financial system today, uh, according to the UN, every year there's anywhere from 2 to 5% of global GDP that is laundered by the traditional financial institutions. Again, that's between 800 billion to $2 trillion. So I think we have to be very careful when we talk about these things. I, I would argue that uh, many of the crypto exchanges you see today, especially those in the US, they probably have better KYC, AML, anti-terrorism financing tools and actually monitoring uh, than actually many of the traditional banks. Why? Because they're able to use the latest rec tech, regular technology, law tech technology. They don't have any legacy systems. And that is actually one of the advantages we have. And this is, I think, one of the biggest misconceptions we often have in the broader public media on this particular topic. Absolutely. I'll add actually a few words to it. This is such an excellent uh, topic you're bringing up, Henry. Uh, and um, agree 100%. Another thing that I want to add when I talk to people about it, and there is this misconception, yes, that Bitcoin is used by criminals and to conduct illicit activity online. It's actually was as early as 2017 or 2018, I don't remember exactly, the UK Treasury issued this very comprehensive report when they looked at different uh, mediums of transfer and institutions and ranked them as to how likely they would be used for the purposes of money laundering activities. So guess what? At the top of the list, cash, traditional banks, insurance companies, trustees, accountants, lawyers, casinos, and the list goes down, 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 down. The last item on the list was Bitcoin. The very last item, because you have a record of every single transaction. We actually work a lot with different transactions in the crypto space, and there are excellent uh, technology providers out there that will do analysis uh, on the source of Bitcoin, you can literally trace every single Bitcoin from the moment it was mined, every single wallet it went through, every single exchange it went through. And like, it's, it's incredible what the technology really lets you do. And it's a huge misconception that uh, people use cryptocurrency to hide money. That might have been the case 10 years ago when no one knew how to use it, what it was, but by now, uh, the regulators around the world, and especially the tax authorities, are incredibly, incredibly knowledgeable at tracing uh, cryptocurrency transactions. I think that website Silk Road probably used only Bitcoin. That's, that's probably played a role into why people think that. Correct. Um, let's, it's a good segue to our next topic regarding government involvement. Henry, I keep reading about CBDCs or central bank digital currencies. This was the cover of The Economist recently, though they called it GovCoin, which to be honest was the first time that I heard that term. I usually hear CBDC. Uh, yeah. What are CBDCs? What will be the impact of CBDCs on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? And how is China's digital currency doing so far? My God, so many big questions. First of all, on this uh, Silk Road, many people don't know, a lot of investigation on Silk Road were Armenian, by the way. You can find this publicly online as well. Many of them were testifying. Uh, and second, GovCoin, the Economist, I actually wrote a letter to the editor to the Economist last week. I don't think it'll get published, 
but it's actually saying that they, they're trying to they use the word golf coin, which you're correct, was the first time being used. Fun fact, The Economist was responsible to coining the term blockchain. Many people don't know, actually, Satoshi Nakamoto in his white paper never uses the word blockchain. He talks about chains of blocks, blocks of chain. The term blockchain was coined in 2015 by The Economist and Bloomberg Magazine, by the way. So here you go. For those of you who have read my last book, I talk, I talk about that as well. You go see, you have the plug of the book in there, you know? Uh, so comes over back to actually to the, the question you asked on government uh, currencies, absolutely. Um, I think whereas Bitcoin is decentralized, nobody can really stop Bitcoin. There's 21 million Bitcoins out there. Maximum, that's it, that's all on it. Um, if today you're a central banker and you love Bitcoin, you're crazy. This is a bit like a taxi driver being excited to see Uber come in their market, right? But of course, central bankers are a bit smarter than uh, taxi drivers suing Uber, what did they do? They said, okay, there's a lot of benefits of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies that we can leverage ourselves. And that's exactly what, what they did. I mean, a bit of interesting fact here as well is that today, again, from a, from a pure macroeconomics perspective, there's really two kinds of central bank money. One of them is good old cash. Man, they're coming in handy today. One is good old cash. And second type of central bank money is the reserves that your bank holds at the central bank. The money that you have, you know, the hard word money that you have in your bank is not central bank money. That is literally debits and credits plus and minuses on the books of that bank. And what is really remarkable, what's so exciting is all of us, everybody listening to this session today, in our lifetime, in the next couple of years, we will see the third form of central bank money, kind of digital banknotes, if you want, that you can hold in your phone that are equivalent literally to like banknotes. This is why people tell me, ah, but I use money that is digital. I don't use cash. Well, yes, but you're using intermediaries, you're using a PayPal's or Venmo's and so on and so forth. Again, it's accounting entries on the books of these uh, players. And this has a lot of implications. I'll give you an example. Today, if in, a, in any economy, if I'm using cash, there's no way for governments to know what, what the economic uh, impact of their policies are. We rely on good old economists to make a finger in the air estimates every quarter. With a CBDC economy, if everybody's using digital currencies, policymakers can know immediately, live, what is the exact economic activity in their country? Second benefit is the black economy. Many of you and wherever you're based today, some of them people may have to make payments in cash. Why? Because you don't pay taxes on it. In countries like Greece, Italy, up to 20, 30% of payments are made in cash. With a CBDC economy, that disappears. And third is money laundering that I addressed before. Pretty much with a CBDC economy, uh, corruption using money, becomes very difficult. Yeah, they try to put their kids into Harvard, wine bottles, watches, but I mean, yes, traditional corruption with the envelope full of cash disappears. And fourth, very powerful from a central banking perspective, is today we live, we live in a very low interest rate environment. Today, in many parts of Europe, there's negative interest rate. In my bank account, for the money I leave in my bank, there's negative interest rate, which is crazy. With cash, that is impossible. That's why actually you have large levels of cash in the system. However, with the CBDC, a central bank could impose negative rates interest rates in my economy. And another big benefit for a central bank, they can kickstart the economy. Today in good old US, Joe Biden is giving everybody $1,400, but actually you may not spend it. As a government, if you want people to spend it, you can make that money that expires in 10 days, for example. So I'll give you 1,400 bucks and you have 10 days to spend it. And when it comes to the topic of CBDC, the future of money, make no mistake, is not being determined in the Silicon Valley, New York, London, where, where else. It's being determined right now in China. China is easily, easily five to six years ahead of the rest of the world, no questions asked. To put things in perspective, the Bank of England launches consultation on CBDC in March 2020. The People's Bank of China launched its first consultation committee on it actually in 2014. So far, in the pilots they've done so far, they process over $2 billion US in transactions. They have 320,000 use cases in millions of wallets. It's very likely over the next couple of months, good old cash, uh, banknotes, what we call M0 in economic terms, will be actually banned in China. And, and this is actually very, very powerful because actually it shows you how advanced China is on that level. China is pretty much cashless, uh, de, de facto, but again, a lot of payments are happening today by Alipay, WeChat Pay. And actually, this gives the central bank a lot of power on that. So it's very, very exciting on that perspective to see what's been happening uh, uh, from a CBDC perspective. And again, if you like this topic, all eyes have to be towards the China. And uh, where is the US on issuing its own CBDC? <laughs> uh, big question. So of course, it's very difficult when you're the reserve currency of the world. There's no real incentive to change the status quo, as you guys know. 
Uh, there's been actually a couple of initiatives over the last couple of years of trying to digitalize the dollar, right? Uh, one of them is actually former CFTC chairman, Chris Giancarlo, who's launched a nonprofit initiative called Digital Dollar, where they try to issue kind of digital currency where it's distributed by the existing banks. So the banks are in, in play and actually they can use that from that perspective. Uh, it's gonna be very interesting to watch how the US reacts to this. I can tell you right now, objectively, uh, PwC published a couple of weeks ago, our first annual global uh, CBDC ranking where we rank central banks. And I can tell you the US is not in the top 10 of neither wholesale nor retail and uh, still very far from it. I think, however, however, for those of you in the US, you should not despair. I'm very bullish on the crypto landscape in the US. Uh, frankly, I think the changes we have seen the last 12 months from the point of Gary Gensler at the SEC, the changes the OCC, and many other changes that Rika was mentioned a couple of minutes ago, is actually, and let's not forget some of the big crypto companies from the Coinbases that are listed to some of the big, big companies. Uh, I'm, I'm still very bullish on the US crypto landscape uh, on that perspective. When it comes to CBDC, it's a bit more challenging. What that you can give a boost to the US actually is what we call stable coins. What is a stable coin? Stable coin is a digital currency that is pegged one-to-one -one by US dollar. You'll say, Henry, what's the point? Why would somebody invest in that? That's stupid. There's a couple of benefits from that. For example, one of them is cross-border payments. Again, if you live in the US, your entire life is in the US, that's not a problem. Use Venmo everywhere, don't worry about it. As any of you try to send money abroad, try to send money from uh, US to Armenia, what you'll see is actually today, the average fee of cross-border payments, average fee is 7%. In many emerging markets, a double digit, right? So, literally, Armenia and US is a great example of this. What actually stable coins allow you is I can send you money grant if I want to today from Hong Kong, from Armenia, where I am right now, literally instantaneously, 24 seven, and actually pretty much for no fee. It happened to me a couple of weeks ago, I was in Hong Kong and I had to send money on a Sunday, make a cross-border payment. My lovely bank does not process any FX, does not process any cross-border payments on a Sunday. I don't know, maybe my bank goes to church. Uh, and what I did instead, I just sent a stablecoin payment. It arrived immediately on the spot. And this is going pretty big. 14 months ago, there was less than $5 billion in stablecoins. These are, again, the digital currencies back one-to-one -one by fiat money. And now there's over 90 billion of those in stablecoins. So definitely that's kind of an area because the majority of these are in US dollar can give a boost to the US. And a great example recently was Libra, uh, now called DM. Uh, the Facebook's offshoot, if you want, a couple of years ago in June 2019, that has now uh, officially announced they're moving the majority of their operations from Geneva back to the U.S. I think that's a great win for the U.S. from that perspective. Before we turn it back to Rika, Henry, you said U.S. is not in the top 10 rankings. Can you share with us the top three? Absolutely. I mean, uh, there's two kinds of CBDC, central bank digital currency. One is the wholesale CBDC, which is between the central bank and the member banks. Uh, in that country, probably the most advanced going on right now as we speak is what's happening between uh, Hong Kong, Thailand, China, and the UAE, uh, in Emirates, which is a project that I'm very actively involved in. And the second project that's very advanced right now is what's happening in Singapore. Uh, you know, I, I teach a three-hour class on this, so I don't even have the time to cover it today, but very, very advanced on wholesale CBDC. On retail CBDC, uh, number one is the Bahamas, second is actually uh, China, and number three, I believe, is Cambodia. But again, uh, Bahamas is a small country. It's a nice place. I go to Bahamas a lot. But actually, when you look at a big country like China uh, from a scale perspective, a G, you know, G10, G, G10, G20 perspective, those are the two big ones. So it's uh, Hong Kong, Thailand, Singapore, and wholesale. And it's a uh, uh, Bahamas, mainland China, and uh, Cambodia on the retail side. And let's see who wins it next year. But this is a big space. Uh, and I can tell you, like I mentioned earlier, 86% of central banks, 86 are looking at the topic of CBDC today. And that's super exciting uh, when it comes not only to finance and legal questions, but also the future of money that frankly impacts us all. Thanks, Henry. Alina? Now we're going to change gears a little bit and uh, talk about law students and lawyers who want to incorporate blockchain and cryptocurrency into their current practices. <laughs> Rika, can you please talk a little bit about the work you do at your firm that involves blockchain and cryptocurrency? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we do a lot of regulatory compliance. We do um, work a lot with projects on the issuance of cryptocurrency and see how these instruments would be treated. If they're regulated by the SEC, we would walk them through um, primary issuance in a compliant way. We would walk them through secondary trading. 
Um, we work a lot with the startups that are raising funds in this space. They might be raising funds in the traditional way. Or they might be raising funds via digital assets. So it's a lot of corporate work. Um, when I talk to uh, um, attorneys who are either transitioning in the space or um, young law students who want to get into the space, I think there are two things that are key to progressing in your career in the space. One thing is having at least a basic understanding of technology. It's really key and uh, Henry gave an excellent introduction on what Bitcoin did and why it's truly a revolutionary technology. I remember when I was getting into the space, there was no, you know, blog to read. There was no article. There were some couple really bizarre YouTube videos on what Bitcoin is and what to do about it. And then I remember uh, this um, class um, on Coursera came out from this cryptography professor at Princeton uh, who was to explain how Bitcoin works. And I've attempted to complete that class four different times. I've only progressed to the middle, but that's when you learn about things like what is a double spend problem? Why is it a problem? Uh, what is a proof of work? What is proof of stake? What is the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum? Why is everyone up uh, and about, uh, you know, about interoperability of blockchains? How does this affect the DeFi space? What does it actually mean to complete a transaction on Ethereum? What is a gas fee? Why do lawyers need to know all these things? Because Unless you understand what people are building, why they're building what they're building, and unless you understand a very basic thing, which is a business model, because no one is building anything just of the purity of their heart. Uh, people are in this business to make money like in any business, right? So if you do not understand the business model, you're not going to be able to provide appropriate legal advice. So when you talk to people, you know, in this space, and it, it can be the space is just so vast at this point, as in one day you can be talking to this 20-year-old coding geniuses, uh, you know, and the next day you can be talking to um, a regulator, to Securities and Exchange Commission, or you can be talking to like a huge asset manager who is entering this space. But all of them are trying to build a product and all of them are building, trying to build a business. How is this supposed to function? What is the difference between um, one project and the other? This cryptocurrency platform network, how it trans so it's, it's a must really. <laughs> and then another thing is um, in the space is, as I mentioned, it's regulated by so many different entities and institutions around the world. Um, so just having a basic um, idea of the space at this point already, I think truly is not enough because when we work on the project, you can have, you know, securities regulations at place, privacy concerns, tax will be an issue. Uh, how this whole thing is structured from corporate perspective. Most of the teams are distributed. This is a global business, right? You have, um, you have global regulations at play. Um, what I've noticed is on most of the projects, we actually compile teams of experts, attorneys in different spaces. So let's say you are an exceptional tax lawyer you can get into the crypto space by understanding the specifics of taxation of these crypto assets. And like a skill like that is really gold these days. Or you can, or maybe you have an expertise in intellectual property, uh, right? And, and, and once you understand the space and how current intellectual property legal issues sort of interrelate and weave into the blockchain space, you can be providing advice in that space. So what I really think is important is having an expertise in one particular area as an attorney, and then understanding how the blockchain related projects function within that space and what particular concerns you might have 
from securities perspective, privacy perspective, uh, money transmitter, um, you know, uh, operators. It's 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 really really key. You need to be able to combine understanding of technology and your legal expertise. There's almost I say there's like no almost no such thing as a blockchain lawyer. What's a blockchain lawyer? You can't be a blockchain lawyer. You're either a securities attorney who understands blockchain space. You're a corporate attorney who understands blockchain space. You're a tax attorney who understands blockchain space. Uh, some of them are interrelated, but it's especially in the U.S. In the U.S., we've taken the approach of um, of applying our existing regulations to this new, uh, exciting, and developing space. Right? It's not a new body of law. It's not a new body of regulations. Many countries have regulatory sandboxes, and they have separate legislature just just dealing with the crypto space. That's one thing. Here, you really need to understand uh, what you're dealing with at a traditional level and then try to apply it in the blockchain space. You know, maybe can I add one thing on this? You know, I know there's a lot of junior lawyers listening to this, right? I think this is a great opportunity for anybody who's a junior lawyer here to actually develop an expertise, right? I remember 15 years ago myself, uh, I went to China. At the time, China was, oh, it was before the Olympics. It was a big thing. That allows me to get a big leap. Here, when it comes to, as a young lawyer, you work at a firm, you want to do private equity, M&A, uh, you know, any kind of traditional lines, good luck. It's going to take you 15, 20 years because it's kind of a pyramid scheme until the old partners retire and so on and so forth. In crypto, it's greenfield. Go write an article. Go do some research over the weekend. Do write an article. You know, about five things any lawyer needs to know about crypto. Right about this topic. These are green fill cases that are the career you can actually get propelled uh, high and above. Again, like Rika mentioned, is, is, right now there's a lot of ways you can learn about them. Coursera, YouTube channels, and stuff like that. It's a great opportunity. If I was a young lawyer today, that's exactly a great area I would, I would, I would pick on. You mentioned many of the others before, you know, marijuana, and uh, actually I'm, I'm a big fan also, like, you know, meatless uh, food and stuff like that. There's so many opportunities right now. Crypto is definitely one of them where you can make yourself as a career. And you're right. I think one of the problems, you know, I've taught at law schools for many years is law schools. I've been completely behind on this. I'm, I'm happy to see some law schools catching up. But the fact that we're letting lawyers graduate today with no courses on smart contracts, basic programming, coding, frankly, you can go read all the case law you want of old British uh, cases of 200 years ago. It's great. But this is kind of a skill set that we need on that side. Second entity, I blame this. I've been very public about this as well as the law societies. I just had to pay my lovely... Uh, bar fees for the next year, although I don't practice anymore. One thing is actually a lot of law societies have been actively taking lawsuits and actually blocking some of the innovation in the space. Uh, you know, to I give it a good example, you know, if you're a real estate lawyer, you're conveyancing for those of you from common law jurisdictions, where you literally, or notary public for those in Quebec or the civil law system, where your job is to make sure that real estate title is clean. I mean, that with blockchain technology, we don't need you anymore. Literally, we don't need you anymore, right? And actually, I've been very sad and very disappointed that intellectually, morally and ethically, we are actually not encouraging this use of new technologies for the protection of our members and protection of the, of, the, of the profession, not the public, which I think is, is kind of one of I think, the weaknesses of, of the system as it is today. Are there any ethical implications for attorneys when dealing with cryptocurrency or blockchain transactions? Um, I'll, I'll say a few words. So, um, once again, uh, you need to be able to understand understand the space slightly. Uh, and as a practicing lawyer, um, you know, I can tell from my perspective, any new project, whether cryptocurrency related or not cryptocurrency related, you need to know who your client is. You need to go through basic due diligence when you onboard a client and you sign that formal engagement letter, right? So when you're dealing with blockchain and we actually accept payment for legal services in crypto and we've been doing it, I think since pretty much since we launched the firm. So what does it mean? What kind of due diligence do you need to do on the project and on the client? You just need to be um, you just need to be aware of the space and what it takes to properly onboard the client. It's not complicated. There are service providers out there full in the U.S., fully licensed, you know, that will do basic things like even invoicing for you in cryptocurrency, and they're connected directly into your operating account. They will do the conversion and the transfer directly into the firm's operating account, um, and it's um, there is no need to be scared of cryptocurrency at all. Um, so I think 
and it depends, you know, a lot depends on whether you're practicing within a huge firm or you have a more of boutique or a solo practice. Um, why I'm saying this, you might have a separate department that's if you're within a big organization, a firm that's responsible for client onboarding. Um, that might not be the case for smaller firms or solo practitioners out there. So if you're working within the um, within the framework of a small firm, you just basically go through the same due diligence process that you would go for your regular client. And with the only caveat is the transaction is done in cryptocurrency and your fees are being paid in cryptocurrency, you need to add this additional layer of due diligence. But once again, um, it, it's such a developed space by now. It's, it's as easy, it's actually easier and cheaper for clients than accepting a credit card payment. We have clients, we have, we have US clients, non-US clients, uh, their, whole, their whole internal administrative and accounting systems are in stable coins by now. They don't even, you know, they don't even deal with fiat currencies. They pay all of their employees in stable coins. They pay all the service providers in stable coins. It's, yeah. Henry, did you want to add anything? Uh, on, on the ethical issue, I think there's a uh, the regular concern that we kind of draws them all. You, it's funny you mentioned stable coins. There's a lot of use cases, definitely. I think people often, uh, when you start experimenting with stable coins and ease of use of some of these crypto platforms, it's way, it's very difficult to go back to your old bank. Just case in point, the stable coins, right? Rika mentioned. Again, a reminder, these are digital assets that are backed by US dollar, right? And these are regulated instruments. So there's like the, the counterpart risk is actually negligible. It, you're able to get a yield now about 10 to 12% on some of these crypto lending platforms, right? So it's actually quite interesting that, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for a lot of people from a cash management perspective, personal banking as well. I have a lot of guys that work in my team where literally they, they operate entirely in crypto pretty much. You know, they use DeFi platforms for lending, they use trading and you can have credit cards right now that are basically, you can leave your crypto and you're able to spend it all. So it's very, very interesting what's happening uh, on that perspective uh, from a technological perspective. And I think that's for us as Armenians, right? because it's the Armenian Bar Association is a great opportunity, not only as professionals, each one of them, but as an Armenian nation as well. Uh, you know, whenever these new technologies come in, the internet was a latest example 20, 30 years ago. Now we're having blockchain or cryptocurrencies. Gives, it's, it's, a, it's a level playing field. And it gives a chance to countries, individuals, to really take advantage of this and actually jump up. I mean, this is why I've been, I've been, I have to say, I've been quite impressed. Uh, I run a group called Crypto Armenians, uh, where every year there's a big conference you have, a host a dinner. We have to do it with a Chinese restaurant because it's the only place I have a big room with two big Chinese tables, you know, in New York. And actually, there's a, there's a very big growing now uh, Armenian community in crypto. If you're interested, please let me know. Reach out. We'll make sure you add to this, to this group. But uh, I've been very happy to see uh, that Armenians more broadly, including uh, lawyers and, and, and whatnot and other accountings, technologists, developers, have been embracing crypto. And I'm very happy to see that. And I believe this is an opportunity for us, especially as Armenia thinks about kind of the 2.0 after the events that happened the last couple of months, this is a great opportunity to kind of rethink about it and actually use these technologies to go a step ahead. Thank you, Henry. Rika, do you have any last words of advice for students or lawyers entering the space? I'll just add on a bit to what uh, Henry said earlier. It's just such an incredible and exciting and fast growing space. And the, you know, the, the sort of the, playing field is pretty still pretty leveled. If you jump into it and you really understand the space, you can certainly propel your career much faster than the, than the traditional, uh, you know, the route. Um, and another incredible thing about this space that I've experienced, you know, as, as an attorney is that as you learn about it, every single person will talk to you respond to email. I mean, pre-COVID, there were a lot of events and a lot of conferences. Everyone is so open and so excited. There are so many people working on truly exciting and innovative and just absolutely inspiring projects. And every single person is who is out there, pretty much every single person will talk to you, will answer the questions, will tell you what they're building, why they're building, will keep their ears and eyes open for new opportunities. It's an incredibly great and collaborative environment and definitely a lot of things to do in the space and it's growing at a really fast 
space. It's a once a lifetime opportunity for a young lawyer. Like this, is, this is the opportunity you have, right? These things happen not every day, right? Where new technological changes, like Rika mentioned, is level playing for its greenfield. Great opportunity, guys, career-wise. I mean. So we have quite a bit of questions coming in. Um, before we get to those time permitted, why don't we do a quick lightning round where I'll give you a word or a name and then you guys just share with us the first thing that comes to your mind or you could say pass. So, and when I give you the word, Rika, why don't you go first and then Henry will go second so we don't talk over each other. All right, so let's start with the easy one, Bitcoin. Gold. <laughs> Future of money. Interesting, Ethereum. Buterin. <laughs> Future of the internet. Dogecoin. Dogecoin. It lives in the future. <laughs> we're, ca we're catching up. <laughs> what about Dogecoin? Oh. <laughs> Elon Musk. An embarrassment. Please stay away from that. It's an, it's an insult to the crypto space. DeFi or decentralized finance. Gas fees. Uh, uh, empowerment, future of uh, financial services. Fiat currency. What? Fiat currency. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, fiat currencies, God. Um, banks. <laughs> For me, it's my monopoly money printing gun. Good answer. Gold. Gold? Outdated. <laughs> I'll say it's Bitcoin's grandfather. <laughs> Central bank digital currencies. I'll say future. I'll be like Henry this time. <laughs> say, um, uh, I think big privacy debates coming up. U.S. Federal Reserve. <laughs> you can say pass. Deficit? <laughs> In God we trust. Yeah. Elon Musk. I'll let Henry go first now. <laughs> Uh, I would say uh, <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely genius, visionary, but uh, man, uh, it, 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 unpredictable. That's a good term, unpredictable. I would love to have lunch with him one day. I've never met him. Love to have a lunch with him and hear, listen to him actually. Not saying listen to him. Warren Buffett. Uh, I have a grandfather. I mean, it's time to go. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Alternative family arrangements. <laughs> That's the thing that comes to my mind. <laughs> okay, last one. Future of money. I, I, I wish I could show crypto, but I can't. <laughs> then it's just ones and zeros on the screen. <laughs> Uh, it's actually the title of my next book coming out later this year, Future of Money. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> Good it's the title of my newsletter, actually. My, every Sunday, I have a newsletter on LinkedIn called The Future of Money. There you go. By the way, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a trademarked. Huh? For those of you interested, it was trademarked by a prop, uh, company, an events company. I'm surprised this went through trademark uh, office. Uh, for any attorneys looking at this, I'm really surprised The Future of Money is, it was able to be trademarked. I think it's unacceptable. But hey, what do I know? Thanks, guys. Alina, do you want to start off with some of the questions from the audience? Sure. Um, Henry, you can answer this one if you want. Sure. <laughs> also jump in. What is Armenia's status in the crypto or stable currencies? Oof, big question. Uh, okay, so um, so Armenia, obviously, guys, as you know, uh, I mean, uh, I'm actually presently in Armenia, so I look forward to seeing many of you here and back in Armenia. Uh, there's obviously uh, one of the benefits I think we have in Armenia, we have a great central bank. I have to say, very impressive central bank. Uh, all the way from the government, all the way down. And of course, like any, any institution or media, central bank is very, very knowledgeable, especially topics like CBDC. Um, so I would say the ecosystem is actually quite, uh, still quite small. The crypto ecosystem, so the central bank is very knowledgeable on the topic. 
Um, there's obviously trade no regulations on crypto per se. Uh, I would say there's a, there's a growing ecosystem. I'm actually the uh, ambassador at large, I think, of the Armenian uh, Blockchain Association. And every year there's a big conference in Armenia, normally in November. So again, if you guys are looking for looking a reason to come to Armenia, it's a great reason to come on that perspective. Uh, and I would say there's also a lot of startups. Actually, myself, uh, I've been funding this uh, social enterprise recently to actually create uh, jobs in crypto. There's actually uh, one of the big companies in Armenia called CoinStats, you know, with the 800,000 monthly active user, actually based in Yerevan. So then this is one of the leading companies in crypto here. So there's a growing ecosystem from that perspective. And what bothers me, I would say right now, is I see everybody and their mom trading crypto in Armenia which is not good. Literally, I was last week taking a plane to Dubai on the lounge. The people next to me were talking about BNB. The other table was talking about Dogecoin. I wanted the plane. The guy bought the Wi-Fi in the plane to trade crypto during the flight. Thankfully, it was over Iran, so he couldn't, didn't work. Uh, there's a lot of retail trading here, and I'm not worried, actually, especially what happened yesterday, the impact of that. But generally, uh, again, my overall, this is a golden opportunity as a country, as a nation, as we think about the future of Armenia, not to think about our old school problems and the old methodologies, this the kind of technologies like these that allow us to, to jump ahead. And I think it's one of those opportunities we need to capture. And all of you on the line, but everybody listening to this, you have the chance to do your little part. You know, always say you become good in this topic, you become a leader, you bring others with you as well. So I think it's a great opportunity for Armenia, Armenians, and the Armenian nation. Thank you. Um, can you recommend any information rich sources for all things crypto? Oh, uh, there's a lot today. I'll give you two, three tips that I use every day. Uh, one, what I recommend to everybody, if you want interested, there's a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, for those who are interested, I have a lot of educational videos on my YouTube page. Uh, it's also now in not only in English, it's in French, Arabic, and Chinese as well. So I have different YouTube pages with a lot of educational videos. Uh, I have a weekly show if you're interested. I LinkedIn, I summarize developments in 60 seconds. There's a lot of books on the topic. Uh, you don't need to read the technical white papers. There's a lot of content. One tip that I give to everybody, two tips actually. One of them is do Google alert. It takes you five seconds, one email a day on, on Bitcoin. It'll, it'll keep you what's happening. Second thing, you want to learn about Bitcoin. Buy, and you, you don't own any, buy $10 of Bitcoin. Just learn it. Naturally, you'll follow more about it. Uh, personally, you know, a couple of years ago at Christmas in a typical Armenian family, my mom, my parents never understood what I do in life. So uh, they were asking me a Bitcoin. They thought I was lying when I told them, I don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is. I gave my mom actually a portion of a Bitcoin. This was years ago. Now it's actually worth quite a bit of money. And, uh, and now she's become the expert of Bitcoin among her girlfriends. But what happened there, my mom naturally went to actually learn about cryptocurrencies. A couple of weeks ago, she emailed me regarding a, a, a symposium on ET 2.0. I was like, wow, that's quite interesting. And I have to say, I don't call her enough. So maybe that's another reason. Uh, but actually, one of the reasons I think you want to learn about it, go on the internet and buy a small amount of crypto. Great for, way for you to learn about cryptocurrencies. What are some advantages, if any, of cryptocurrency utilization for developing economies like Armenia? I'll be taking on if you want. Oh, yeah, I'll be taking on. The best one is CBDC. So if Armenia today, think about it, a small country, we're only 2 million people, let's face it. Uh, there's obviously a terrible tax system of personal tax. Many of you don't know there's no personal tax regime that is well. Uh, many, a lot of people work on the black economy, lots. Uh, so actually one of the benefits you have in a CBDC economy, you can really control tax, tax uh, monitoring. Second, we can actually reduce the risk of money laundering, which is a big problem for Armenian banks because of Iran being next door in the sanctions regime. Uh, third, it uh, really allows to empower the economy. Really as a small country, we're very tech savvy. We have an excellent central bank, really allows us to actually spearhead and be a, a leader when it comes to central bank and monetary policy, which I think would be great. And fourth, is financial education. I think as an Armenia, as a nation, we're behind when it comes to financial education. You'll be surprised the number of people I meet in Armenia that don't have a bank account. They never heard of you know, the principle of interest rate, why you need to save, why you need to invest. And I think these are things where actually, when we look at cryptocurrencies, CBDCs, but also fi frankly, financial education more broadly has a lot of benefits. And I think, again, this is a great opportunity for Armenia to capture. Uh, and I think all of you have a role to play because legal regulatory is a big area of that. So I think it's a role, uh, each one of us, uh, can play on that on that on that basis. I, I think it's also a great opportunity, uh, Henry. It's interesting that you mentioned that the traditional banking penetration is very low. Um, so it's exactly countries like this that I think would be much faster and better at adopting this new technology and new financial systems because essentially they can 
leapfrog the whole you know traditional banking and credit card and all of this development because there is no need for it anymore so for people in the us when we think about crypto we're like why do we need crypto why do we need stable coins i have venmo i have chase quick pay i can swipe a credit card like there is no convenience yes because all of those systems are linked to our bank account that is not the case in the rest of the world, right? And that is not the case. So if you have a country with very low banking, traditional banking penetration, this is an exceptional opportunity to actually forge ahead and leapfrog the whole traditional financial system. That, that is point, outdated at this point. It, you raise a very good point because something we forget often, many of the ABA members are in New York, are in the US, Canada, we have great central banks and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Think about the Armenians are in Lebanon. As you know, Lebanon, the banks, people don't have the bank access anymore after what happened this year. So think people have worked all their years, the money's in the bank, they don't have access to it anymore. Think about the Armenians in Syria, what happened to them. Think about the Armenians in Turkey, where actually currency got devalued by 15% over a weekend. Think about the Armenians in Argentina, where the devaluation is a de facto reality of every day. So I think many of us are very privileged to live in countries where you trust their authorities. And this is not only I'm giving the Armenian example. Think about Zimbabwe, Cyprus, a couple of years ago, great other Armenian city as well. So this is why places like these, Bitcoin and decentralized currencies have also a role to play as well. I think there's, we, and we would all benefit uh, from financial education and education on this topic more broadly as, as individuals and as a nation as well. One more question um, for me. How might, how might a newfound venture capitalist like myself approach Armenia and crypto? Armenia and crypto. Um, I mean, guys, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of startup opportunities, you know, I can tell you in Armenia right now, there's tremendous startup activity. It's, it's really amazing. The big problem for these companies is seed capital, right? Basic funding. We're not talking a lot of money. We're talking two, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. And it goes a long way here for startups. If you're looking at actually looking at the startups in Armenia, there's tremendous opportunities. Uh, many companies now are actually raising their millions of dollars. Uh, there's many funds allow you to uh, get, invest in Armenia. Uh, I think, you know, I'm, I'm very, um, uh, very uh, disappointed, I would say, as a, as a diaspora Armenian, where I see now everybody happening with political climate and there's people complain. You know, it's very easy to complain on Facebook, Instagram, and put these tweets and whatever. If you really want to lead by action, you lead by action. Come invest in a startup in Armenia. It's worth more than all these Facebook complaints and stuff like that. I think my message to all of you, as lawyers, for example, as a legal community, why don't we lead by example and actually we do what we can do, which is either helping our legal system here, investing in some of these uh, companies here, and we can all do it. It doesn't take a lot of money, by the way. So I think all of us, uh, if we just lead by example, if you just come this summer, you know, here, I can tell you here, the Armenian tourism market is absolutely, Armenia is more beautiful than ever. Uh, and I'm surprised the number of Armenian attorneys that I meet who spend their time in the Dominican Republic, go to the French uh, 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 Côte d'Azur, when actually we can come to our Armenia and see the beauties we have here. So if there's one thing you can do, the beautiful holidays, after you get vaccinated, come and take a beautiful trip to Armenia. And we look forward to welcoming you. And if you come, anybody who attended this, I promise you I will take you out for drinks and a dinner. Here we go. There's a challenge to everybody listen today. Thank you, Henry. One more question came in for Rika. Do you see a lot or a statistical significance amount of cross-border investment into crypto funds what are the typical legal costs for that country or specific what uh, can you hold on can you repeat that cross-border investments into crypto funds yes. or crypto funds do you see a lot or a statistical significant amount of cross-border investment into crypto funds um look <laughs> This is a loaded question, so um, I'm going to ask a, a answer as a traditional attorney. It depends. Um, so there is definitely a lot of interest in the crypto space, but not. So there are two types of crypto funds, the way I look at it. There are crypto funds, well, more than two types. What kind of crypto funds? Is it a trading fund that's like similar to a hedge fund? Is it a venture capital fund? Is it a fund that invests in blockchain and crypto projects, or is it a fund that actually tokenized its own limited partnership interests? What is their investment strategy? The one thing I actually tell all the people involved in the blockchain space and all the projects or fund managers who are raising money is blockchain is not some fairy dust that you sprinkle on your project and all of a sudden people just throw money at you. Like if you essentially, do you have a working business model? Are you bringing value to your investors? 
what it is that you, what is it that you're building or if you're a fund what it is that you're investing into just because you put you know like crypto blockchain as a word out there doesn't change the fundamental economics right of what you're doing so it really depends um what what kind of fund what are you trading um it's it, it's really hard to say basically i'll put it this way if there is no interest from like the project of the fund should make sense financially that's that's all i can say and then if it's a it's if it's crypto that might be an additional and added benefit to your investor but if the project doesn't you know, is not interesting to investors fundamentally, that's not going to change just because blockchain is involved. Unless we're talking about NFTs, but that's a whole different topic. But it's growing fast. So to be fair, the crypto fund industry is growing very, very quickly as well. Huh? I'm actually, for those interested, on Monday morning, uh, ADM will be launching a new crypto hedge fund report. And you can see the data is very impressive. The numbers are growing. Don't forget that for a lot of institutional investors, the big pension funds, endowments, foundations, uh, often the way you know they, they want to discover crypto, what they do often the first step is to invest in a crypto fund. They learn about it, they see, they discover, and over 10, 20 years, they bring the expertise in-house. By the way, very similar to what happened with uh, the VC hedge fund and payroll. You know, in, in the 1997, the total AUM, of, crypto, of hedge funds was around $180 billion. Now it's $4 trillion. And same thing may happen, I believe, with the crypto hedge fund industry, where now the AUM is less than $4 billion. We may see this grow. Uh, if it just grows to 10% of traditional hedge fund world, it's 100x growth. Anybody, anyone of listening, you're a fund lawyer, we do asset management, here's your opportunity, here's your partner case. This is your opportunity to make revenue if you're going on your own or fund. This is what I mean, it's green field. So uh, great, great example of actually an area of, that will ex experience tremendous amount of growth. Thanks, Henry. Unfortunately, we're not going to get to the rest of the questions. We're well over our one hour mark. Thank you so much, Rika. Thank you, Henry. Thanks for joining us today. Everybody, thanks for joining. Take care. Thank thanks you for, for having us. Thanks for letting us uh, share our passion yeah. with you all. Thank you very much. Thanks.